So I, I'm from Long Island, like the Long Island Queens border. And when I was a kid, you would see the guys from like the Peter Tattoo Shops and you would see Steve Bonji from the Hells Angels. And there was always this air on Long Island of like the tattoo guys. And they all pretty much look the same, like big Irish or Italian guys just covered in tattoos. There was a tattoo shop in East Meadow around the block from my grandmother's house. And I lied to my mother and I told her I had to do a report on tattooing for school. You know, I remember it like it was yesterday morning, like the smell of green soap and cigarettes. And I would say that like then I became completely obsessed. This is on my friend Brian, still looks insane. This is on Rob York. It was it was rare to see Ed's tattoos near us, but there were like one or two guys. Oh, and an interview with Ledger. And I think like 10th grade, you know, the older guys were starting to get tattoos. That guy, Rob York, the dude with the Balinese chest yeah. panel, he was the first guy I knew that had tons of fucking tattoos. 24-year-old Robert York of Merrick, Long Island, works in the mainstream where he feels the need to cover up. But with little untattooed skin left, his secret is hard to keep. And he was getting tattooed by Mike Ledger. Everyone that we know had been tattooed by Mike Ledger or Mike Perfetto. At the time, we were such Ledger loyalists. Like, we just, we wanted a bodysuit from Ledger. I didn't even know other tattoo artists were good. There was a few shops in Suffolk County that did their own thing, but like the Peter Tattoo chain around here was scary, you know, like that hardcore biker scene. But Ledger was a few years older than us and like an old school hardcore kid, skinhead guy. Like he made it okay for like our generation to walk in there and want to get tattooed. So at that time, I was the first person to leave Peter Tattoo. It was always a deal. I teach you how to tattoo, but you can never leave. So I left, I went underground in, in, in Farmingdale. It was me, Chris Kutis, who was uh, my, my kind of receptionist at that time. I started working for Mike Ledger privately. Um, I'm gonna say 94, 95. So he broke away from Peter Tattoo. He started tattooing privately and Mike asked me to work for him. And in, in exchange, you know, he was gonna offer me an apprenticeship. I was dealing with a lot of uh, bikers trying to retaliate on me leaving. Back then it was a lot different than now. Tattooing was illegal in the city. It was still underground, I loved that. I started the apprenticeship with Mike Ledger and then Mike had some problems and basically we kind of went our separate ways. I guess in the meantime of all that, Brad opened up High Roller. <laughs> but I met him around 92, 93 at Peter Tattoo in Hempstead. So he was in a band, wheelchair, and everybody kind of knew each other in the tattoo slash hardcore scene. And uh, he was using Mike Ledger and I was using Mike Ledger. So we kind of had that bond. Brad was living in Richmond Hill, down the block from his dad's plumbing shops. He'd just go there, get tattooed and just talk about tattooing. And, and the concept of high roller came up, you know, because we were skateboarders. We didn't want to go get tattooed by thugged out bikers. High roller had just opened. So this is like 1996. It was Bradley, Bradley's friend, Mike Chisulo which was like his right-hand man. Brad said, hey, listen, I know you're tattooing on the side. Why don't you come here and you could be the shop guy and I'll let you tattoo your friends after hours. When I met Brad and Mike, these guys had Swallows, they had Sailor Jerry Flash, they had all this stuff that New York was not getting. 
like me and all my guys, we were getting like Geiger and, you know, try them on all like New York City style stuff. When I first started off, I just wanted black and gray, like, you know, typical Geiger, black and gray, New York City hardcore looking, you know, tough tattoos. When Brian and Mike, they had tattoos on them that guy, we just weren't getting. Those guys brought to Long Island a style of tattooing that really hadn't existed here before. Ninety-five, ninety-six. He was already had full sleeves. He had his neck done. His hands were done. He had that crazy back piece by Mike Ledger. They were covered in fucking tattoos. They were like nefarious because Mike played in a band called the Fifty Two X, which was like the wildest hardcore band from our scene. Dudes would end up naked, guitars smashed. It was wild, and Brad was like in that crew. Chris was easing his way into going from counter guy to doing tattoos. And that was my entrance to be able to start mopping the floors and just doing anything that these guys would ask me. During the first summer I was working there, the roster of guys that came through there was mind boggling. I met Seth. He was the first guy I knew that knew the names of all the parts of the machines. Like, I could put together machines, but I didn't know, like, why coils did what they did. This is when I realized that these were the most tenacious and obsessive guys I had ever been around. It's when I saw guys dropping $300 on a book. But, you know, it's Horiyoshi's world. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. But now you're looking at hand-done bodysuits by Koronuma, Horiyoshi 2. Like, very few people had like, an in-depth library. You know, and this is pre-internet. Dude, I traded my car for a book. I traded a Mercury Sable with a brand new transmission for Huck Spaulding's A to Z of tattooing. Brad had Sailor Jerry Flash all over. Brad had... Mike Wilson flash, he had Dave Gibson flash, and no tattoo parlor in New York had this stuff going on. It was like a really good meeting place where everyone would come and nerd out. Chris O'Donnell started showing up, Mike Wilson, you know, Rubendahl was very young, he would come around. Timothy was there, Eli Quinters was there as a young dude working, Danielle DiStefano. Do you, I'm, I'm saying these guys are in like their first fucking years of tattooing and they're like, wow, there's this crazy place. I'll travel out from the city to do a day shift there. And dude, it was wild. He just did whatever the fuck he wanted. He built a, a half pipe in his shop for, for guys to skate. He made his guest artists have this sort of wonderland environment of just fun, you know. Bradley was lucky enough to have a safety net. I fed off the energy and it was really fucking manic. And these guys were seriously maniacs. I really see High Roller as a, a big turning point in my career. I've been tattooing, I think, two years at that point. I was very green. I learned so many invaluable lessons that I still apply to my day-to-day -day tattooing. I was able to meet Jeff Whitehead, I was able to meet uh, Jeff Rasher, and very importantly, I was able to meet Mike Wilson. So Mike Wilson introduced me to Burt Crack. I've been working for Burt for the last uh, 13 years now. I felt like there was just talented, like-minded kids searching for something, and and everyone found each other. It was like this birth of like this renaissance. I never had an experience of getting tattooed by friends because you like who they are. He had a pure love for the craft that you don't see today. He shaped a lot of people and, you know, me being one of them. I remember Brad came up to me one day, he's like, I got a sick artist coming. His name is, you know, Grime. You should get tattooed by him. And I'm like, okay. And that was it. 